Good afternoon and thank you for joining this uh, webinar launch event for our new NIHR and Department of Health and Social Care funded report um, from us, the PHG Foundation. I'm Colin Mitchell. I'm Acting Head of Humanities at the PHG Foundation. Um, we're a health policy think tank based at the University of Cambridge, concerned with the application of genomics and, and related innovative health technologies. I'm delighted to be joined by an expert panel to discuss the key findings from the PHG report on the control of confidential patient information uh, notices issued by the government in England, which allow healthcare organisations, researchers and others to process and share confidential patient information for COVID-19 related purposes. And we'll say a bit more about these notices shortly. In terms of the order of this session, um, shortly I'll be introducing our panel, but then myself and other members of the PhD Foundation team will quickly run through what we think are some of the key highlights of our research before opening up to the panel's reflections and, and the Q&A. So I'll introduce the panel briefly now but we will return uh, when they've all joined after the PhD presentation to, to meet them again and to begin the panel discussion. So our, our distinguished panel today, we're very lucky to have Professor Annika Lucasen, who's Professor of Clinical Genetics at the University of Southampton and Director of the Centre for Personalised Medicine in Oxford. David Seymour, who is Alliance Director at Health Data Research UK. We'll be joined by Jacob Lant, who is Head of Policy, Public Affairs and Research and Insight at Healthwatch England, and Alison Hall, who is Senior Advisor here in the Humanities team at the PhD Foundation. So what we're going to explore today is the impact of the COPI notices on the use of confidential patient information for genomic and medical research purposes and potential lessons that they may hold for future policy directions. So before we begin with the panel discussion, myself, Alison, our colleague Tanya Brigden, we're going to, we're going to provide a short overview of the research and, and some key findings. So I'll share my screen now. and begin by saying again that this was research funded by the NIHR, National Institute of Health Research and Department of Health and, and Social Care Policy Research Programme, uh, and also to acknowledge the contribution of our co-author, Dr. Sarah Cook, who was a science policy analyst at the PhD Foundation. So as I said earlier, we're going to quickly provide an overview of the research and move on for the panel discussion. But I'm also aware that, first of all, I probably need to provide a, a bit of background. Um, our new report considers how the control of patient information or COPI notices have impacted genomic and medical research uh, and whether there are lessons for the reform of the regulatory framework in the longer term. So the control of patient information for COPI notices uh, were introduced early in the pandemic in March 2022 uh, to enable the use of confidential patient information for COVID-19 purposes. In essence, they set aside the way that the normal common law duty of confidentiality applies for some COVID-19 purposes. Uh, and they also mandate or remove discretion around the disclosure of that information in certain circumstances and in uh, between certain actors as set out in the notices themselves. So during the pandemic, uh, the notices have actually been extended three times with their expiry date now set at March 2022. Our research addressed two interrelated questions. First, the question of how these regulatory changes um, 
have impacted genomic and, and other medical research. And second, the broader and more normative question, which is should all or some of these changes be permanently integrated into the regulatory framework going forwards? I won't go into too much detail here, and th all this information is, is readily available in our report, which is free to download on our website. But just to outline the approach we took, we adopted a number of methods, including reviews of the scientific landscape and legal framework, interviews with key stakeholders, uh, and consideration of patient attitudes and concerns by our, our own snapshot focus group led by Traverse, and also through review of wider evidence and research on patient attitudes that's developed over the course of the pandemic. Okay, today we really want to focus on our findings. So I'll turn it over to Alison, who will begin with those which relate to the first question of how the changes have impacted research. Over to you, Alison. Thank you. So um, as Colin mentioned, um, the legal analysis in section two of our report describes the impact of the COPE notices on facilitating confidential patient information for research. And we particularly wanted to understand the impact of the COPE notices on genomic research. And Sarah Cook, one of our science policy analysts, um, looked at how confidential patient information was made available for research, describing the agencies that were involved, um, highlighting exemplar projects that relied on the COPE notices. And you'll find more information about that in, in section uh, 3.4 and appendix two of our report. And together, um, all these um, agencies, organizations and projects built a better understanding of the pandemic in terms of the virus, the nature of the virus and the impact of disease. And our interviews with stakeholders reiterated the findings that the coping notices had had a demonstrable impact uh, in understanding the pandemic. Next slide, please, Colin. So moving to the second question that our, our research was designed to, um, designed to address, should part or um, all of the changes be permanently integrated into the, into the regulatory framework? And this science, uh, scientific um, work that we did, suggested that there is a continuing need to understand the relationship between the virus and disease and host genomic factors, as well as how changes in the virus impact on um, the ability to, to spread and, and cause disease. And as recent news about the Omicron um, variant has highlighted, there is continuing need for viral and disease monitoring and surveillance. But of course, there are other diseases such as flu that uh, we know that there are variants that we take continually and they cause a significant number of deaths each year without relying on the COPE notices. So continued reliance on the COPE no notices needs regular justification and review. And it, our, the key challenge uh, will be to identify a proportionate approach that balance, balances the potential benefits from research and surveillance with potential harms. So as Alison says, in terms of future policy and, and measures relating to COVID-19, there's clearly that, that element of continued rationale around um, measures for COVID-19 purposes. But we're aware and our research highlights that policy policymakers will, will want to maintain and build on some of the benefits that we'll talk about shortly um, that have been experienced for research during the pandemic. Um, and our report also considers potential wider implications of this experience for broader research purposes. So, you know, certain, certain further reforms or proposals could be envisaged, for example, continued mandatory data sharing for specific purposes or between specific actors, for example, to trusted research environments for research purposes. There are a range of, of reforms that could be um, envisaged, but what our research does and what our analysis does is identify a set of key ethical and legal considerations that will apply to 
all decisions about future directions and, and future reforms. I'll turn over to Tanya now to start taking us through some of these ethical and legal considerations and also just quickly to introduce yourself. Hi, yes. Um, so my name is Tanya Brigden. For those who don't know me, I'm the Humanities Policy Analyst at the PhD Foundation, and I've been working with Alison and Colin on this project, focusing particularly on ethical considerations, but also on the public attitudes um, work. And I'm just going to talk through some of the findings now. So one of the, the kind of key issues that was raised repeatedly in our research um, was trust and fostering confidence in the systems and the processes that promote data sharing. And when we looked into different levels um, of trust across different sectors and organisations, we found that trust in NHS was higher than in other stakeholders, and that this might be um, linked to assumptions about what the data will then be used for. So there's an assumption that the NHS will use data for public benefit. Um, and for example, there's an assumption that commercial organisations will not, and that they're financially motivated and of course it's not as black and white as that and so this mistrust um, might be fueled to some extent through a lack of understanding. Now participants in public dialogues and in focus groups spoke in terms of, of trust but it seems that actually the focus for organisations and systems should be on demonstrating trustworthiness rather than on gaining trust and this is a distinction that has gain traction largely due to the philosopher um, Honora O'Neill, who argues that rather than relying on people to place trust in particular organisations, um, it's important to direct efforts into being trustworthy. And so all stakeholders and data custodians need to ask themselves, what can I do to show that my organisation and the way that we use data is trustworthy? And this emphasis on demonstrating trustworthiness rather than eliciting trust was reinforced by our expert interviews that we held. Um, and although publics don't speak in terms of trustworthiness, they do clearly value what might be considered characteristics of trustworthiness, such as public involvement and engagement, such as transparency, um, and public benefit being the primary motivation for data use or sharing. And so when it comes to thinking about whether these changes should be permanently integrated into the regulatory framework, investing time and resources into promoting characteristics of trustworthiness might help generate collaborative agreement. And this is included in our list of considerations that you can find in the report. Next slide, please, Colin. Another important consideration is transparency. And even though there's widespread support um, for measures to address COVID-19, the findings from the empirical work indicate that transparency is important, even during a pandemic, and despite the urgency with which data needs to be collected to advance understanding of COVID. And this desire for transparency was reinforced during the Traverse focus group that was held. Um, participants felt there should be more information about what was being done with their data under the COVID notices. But when thinking about transparency requirements, um, interviewees raised the fact that it isn't about bombarding the public with huge volumes of information about COVID notices either. It's about finding a balance and providing them with enough accessible information that they can understand the implications for them, and that will differ person to person. The interviewees also suggested that public engagement is an effective tool to help do this, and that the opportunity to ask questions and to interrogate can increase transparency and understanding, and it can also provide a mechanism to enable patients and publics to be more involved and shape decisions about who has access to data that concerns them and for what purposes. Next slide, please, Colin. That being said, we are aware that there can be a tension between embedding thorough public engagement and deliberation and the need to develop new approaches to data um, as quickly as possible, for example, during a pandemic. And whilst there is a greater acceptance of measures taken in this context, in the longer term, when thinking about regulatory change, um, engagement might be essential if it's to be accepted by patients and professionals and the public. We found that public dialogues and conversations with our interviewees really highlighted that the public want their views to be taken into account. Um, in the Foundations of Fairness report in 2020, that I'm sure lots of you are familiar with, 
um, it was found that despite all the anonymization measures in place, the public would still really care about how their data was used. And 74% of people believe the public should be involved in decisions about how the NHS data is used. And in part, this might be because people want to know their views are being represented in what can be quite difficult value judgments about who should get access to data and for what purposes. And then just finally, it's also important to note that there is no single public, but instead a range of publics with different perspectives and experiences, including those that have slightly less trust in the government and decision makers. And so it might require public engagement at a local level across communities, rather than just a national level to address um, the complexity and variety of, of public concerns. And again, this is captured in our report considerations. So I'm just going to hand you back to Alison now, who's going to touch on consent and choice. Yes, so we also looked at the national data opt out in, and its role in allowing citizens to um, opt out of the use of confidential patient information for research. Um, and we really just noted that choices made by patients um, through the national data, data opt out also has an impact on the use of, of data for research and highlights the, the important um, role of, of consent um, in influencing how confidential patient data is used. But one of the things we also highlighted in, in our work was how there wasn't a shared understanding or consensus between healthcare professionals, between researchers and publics about the role, the limits, uh, uh, to consent and choice, and, and that's something that we might pick up in our discussions. Thank you. Thanks, Alison. Yeah, securing privacy and, and safeguarding data is also something that came out as, as paramount, paramount in our research, which, you know, confirms findings from the wider empirical evidence that most people are comfortable with data being used when it's in an anonymous form. Um, however, as we discuss in our legal analysis, defining what is meant by anonymous is, is complicated and potentially differs depending on whether data protection rule or the law of confidentiality is being considered. Um, and there still needs to be, as Tanya suggests, a level of transparency even around these measures and transparency in particular around residual risks. A related consideration um, is that regulatory reform might not be the be all and and end all if there are technical measures and, and safeguards that can be used to achieve some of these same goals. Um, so it might be that promising measures such as trusted research environments, um, technical encryption measures and de-identification methods can be used to avoid the need for linking or, or sharing confidential patient information for research purposes. A trusted research environments that have been developed, for example, by Open Safety at the University of Oxford um, are highly promising in, in this regard. Um, but that, as Tanya has already emphasized, there is still an overarching question which relates to perceptions of trustworthiness and, and confidence in the system. And a final consideration highlighted by our legal and scientific reviews and interviews in particular is a, is a bigger picture question is the challenging overlapping friction between different domains when, when reforms are brought forward or proposed. Um, and what's emphasized in particular through our interviews is that joined up approaches required. So that, for example, the interaction between data protection and confidentiality doesn't become a complicated and, and highly difficult environment to navigate as it is reported by some to be at the moment. Uh, another key area of overlap is between public health surveillance activity and scientific research. Um, as we highlight in our report, there are activities, particularly in relation to the pandemic and COVID-19, which could form either side of this, of this potential divide. But that has significant implications about the governance framework that therefore applies. So care needs to be taken about, about the overall picture changes that to be made around confidentiality. So 
we've just provided a very quick overview and, and the report and executive summary are, are freely available on our website and I'll encourage you to take a look if, if you already haven't. Um, but overall, I think there are three levels of conclusion. The, the first is that the KP notices have had a really significant positive impact on genomic and health research. But, but this is nuanced and it may be in a number of ways that require untangling. They operate as a new legal basis to a degree but also a really powerful signal and spur to enhance processes, pathways, and, and data sharing. Second, and, and in relation to the extension of notices or further kind of COVID-19 based exceptions, we caution that there should be careful consideration of the proportionality and, and transparency of any further measures in this regard. And third, in relation to reforms to take forward beneficial changes for research more broadly, we highlight a key set of ethical and, and legal considerations that we outline that should be taken into account for these to maximise the potential of data for health and, and ensure public confidence in processing. So that was a whistle-stop tour of our uh, research and we will drop out shortly. Um, I just want to make sure that we acknowledge uh, the expert input from our external advisory panel for their guidance in this research and also from our colleagues at Traverse who helped us with our focus group. And I'm very pleased to say that all the panellists have now successfully joined us. I'm sorry for those technical difficulties. Thank you all. So I'll just reintroduce everybody. Um, on the panel today we have uh, Professor Annika Lutzen, who is Professor of Clinical Genetics at the University of Southampton and Director of the Centre for Personalised Medicine at the University of Oxford. We have David Seymour, who is Executive Director of the UK Health Data Research Alliance at QCR UK. Uh, Jacob Lant, who is Head of Policy, Public Affairs, Research and Insights at Health Watch England. And Alison Hall, who is Senior Advisor in our Humanities team at the PhD Foundation. So I'll just drop out my screen share here. And move over to begin and open up to the panel. And we'll be taking audience questions, so please do get your questions in the Q&A as we go through this, or if anything has inspired a question already. But I'd just like to turn first to the panel in turn um, and first to you, Annika, and then David, Jacob, and Alison, and, and ask each of you really to say a little bit about your role and expertise and, and comment on how the report, its findings, or, or its topic impact your area of work in particular. Over to you, Annika. Great, thank you very much. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm a um, professor and consultant in clinical genetics. Um, in Southampton for the last 20 years, but um, since September this year, moving to um, the University of Oxford, hence the long title description for me. Um, and I was an um, external advisory mem member of this panel for this report. So I just wanted to say a little bit about my expertise, as you asked me to. Um, my clinical work involves genetics and genomics. I'm going to use those terms interchangeably, um, and how that um, affects individuals and families. So for example, if someone's got a, a really strong family history of young onset cancer or particular rare diseases, um, my clinical role is to look into the um, genetic explanations behind um, those. And my research role um, examines the ethical and legal issues raised by these developments um, particularly in, in big data in general, where genomics is a really good example of a, a fast emer emerging form of big data. So uh, the field of uh, genomics is rapidly evolving. Um, we still often, uh, both I mean publics, professionals, patients alike, um, assume that um, genetics is very clear cut. The, the language of our blueprint is still very uh, prevalent in the public discourse, um, but that is really true for only a, a tiny, tiny percentage of the variation that we hold in our genetic code. And even um, where um, 
we once thought a variation in the genetic code was very clear cut. For example, you've got this variant or mutation in this gene, you will get disease X. Um, we now find that um, this is not always so. So some people have the variant um, never gone to develop the condition. And sometimes we find evidence that actually the variant doesn't really play a part at all. And we have to revise what we've um, told patients. And so often the only way that we can arrive at that better knowledge about variants and what they mean for human health is to look at them in large populations um, and compare the findings um, in those large populations uh, with clinical information on people to see what effects these variants have on a large scale. Um, and to do this, we often need to share genetic information linked with clinical details from research databases and feed that back into clinical practice. And I think that's a really good example of, um, uh, of the boundaries between research and clinical practice becoming much more blurred in this area. And it's, it's becoming really hard to say, is this activity research or is it clinical practice? They are uh, the hybrid activities and, and very much entwined yet as you've already highlighted really well there are different rules and regulations around these activities which means that when you're doing something at the interface there's a, a real uh, risk of an activity stalling because people don't quite know what to do there. So I'm very used in clinic to meeting with um, patients who assume that their results or their data will be used to benefit otherwise automatically and they're often quite surprised when I tell them this is um, tricky to do, even when they explicitly ask for it. So you might say, here is explicit consent uh, for sharing, but there aren't the systems in place um, to create that learning healthcare environment that, um, uh, that is necessary in that particular situation. And where the, the space between research and clinical practice um, isn't agile enough yet um, to, to move between them very easily. And another example of that comes from uh, UK Biobank, a really large um, research cohort of half a million people. Um, and I'm chair of its ethics advisory committee. And their participants gave explicit consent to linking of their medical records uh, with data in UK Biobank. Um, but whether or not uh, GPs provided that information to UK Biobank was left at the GP's discretion, um, really illustrating the sense of research being a sort of optional extra to clinical care rather than entwined with it. And so the copy notices, I think, have been very helpful in um, mandating that sharing rather than suggesting it's a, it's a sort of, as I say, optional extra. But research, as you've highlighted and we've highlighted, has also really um, clearly found understandable concerns that genetic results might be used to discriminate against people, for example, by insurance companies, or sold to others for profit uh, without that, those benefits going back into healthcare. And uh, uh, the, as the report highlights very nicely, the general practice data for research and planning GP. DRP initiative has provided a really good example of this because um, at quite short notice, millions of patients exercise their, their opt-out rights uh, because they were worried about um, the, the sort of the more negative uses of their data and couldn't see the, um, the overall advantages of, um, of sharing that data for um, healthcare. And so one way to protect against these concerns is to only share information for which we've got explicit consent. But that becomes more and more difficult as the, the range of data and um, actors in this space becomes broader and broader. So I think, uh, as you've highlighted really nicely in that introduction and in the report, consent, of course, remains very important. We don't want to get rid of it altogether, but it can no longer do all the ethical work in this space. Um, and we need to focus very much on other ethical attributes to support a broad consent um, to make data available for learning about healthcare. And those other um, attributes are trustworthiness, as the report highlights, transparency and engagement and highlighting where public benefit might um, arise. And in a chapter for the um, 
uh, Chief Medical Officer's uh, annual report, which was published in 2017 on Generation Genome, together with Jonathan Montgomery, um, a lawyer, and uh, Michael Parker, a medical ethicist, I wrote about the need for a, a broad rethinking of the social contract in medical practice and research uh, in order to secure the, um, the benefits of genomic medicine. And I think this report has been really helpful in, in highlighting that um, call, and, and I hope that we'll get some really interesting discussion about this. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Annika, for multiple things there, giving us a really nice grounding in the clinical and particularly the genetic and genomic context, and also touching on all, all of those major issues I'm sure we'll pick up on later around consent, trustworthiness, and onto the social contract or social license. Um, David, can I can I throw the question to you, which is really, you know, can you say a little bit about your role expertise and, and where this report touches on that? Absolutely, yes, thanks, Colin. Um, and, and really, I suppose it's worth saying that it definitely recognise many, if not all, of the aspects of the report. And uh, I think it's obviously really come together very well. Um, in terms of my sort of experience, I guess, if I ever relate it particularly to, so within Health Data Research UK, our overall sort of mission is to unite UK's health data to enable discoveries that improve people's lives. So obviously having an ethical, trustworthy way of doing that is absolutely essential. Through the UK Health Data Research Alliance, uh, we've now got over 60 uh, sort of data custodians from national bodies, medical research charities, health data research hubs, NHS trusts, uh, sort of research cohorts, etc. That are coming together to really try and establish those best practice principles for use of data at scale in the public benefit. Uh, and I guess during the, uh, the sort of the, the pandemic, uh, during the early stages of the pandemic, HGR UK really sort of, I suppose, took on three sort of roles one was around trying to sort of help to prioritize the research uh, activity where that was sort of coming in from a range of different places secondly then to try and accelerate access to the data and thirdly almost like bringing those things together in a sort of matchmaking uh, type piece of trying to bring the sort of expertise with the data uh, and, and with the sort of the routes to access that sort of evolved into a thing called the data and connectivity national course study uh, which was one of uh, six national core studies set up by uh, Patrick Valance uh, in sort of October of, of 2020. Uh, and we sort of co-lead that with the Office of National Statistics. Um, and that sort of, the other national core studies cover things like epidemi epidemiology and surveillance, transmission environment, longitudinal health and wellbeing, immunity, and the sort of different clinical trials. I guess the, the sort of the benefit of that, that work is that we're able to work with the different national data custodians and trusted research environment providers uh, across the four nations. Um, so NHS Digital within England and also the Office of National Statistics and their Secure Research Service, uh, the Sale Data Bank in Wales, Scottish National Data Safe Haven and Health and Social Care Northern Ireland, who up until uh, the sort of the pandemic and the investment through data and connectivity weren't able to access, provide access uh, from a sort of remotely to the, the, the Northern Irish data. Um, more recently, that work's also extended to include partners like Open Safely um, and also partners in Scotland uh, that are putting together the Outbreak Data Analysis Platform, which brings together the host and the viral genome data um, from studies obviously like COG UK work uh, and also the genomic work alongside the Azuric. Uh, 4C clinical characterization data and routine health data. So that in itself presents that sort of real challenge in many ways, those flow of data are only possible under currently under the COPE notices. I guess in terms of the biggest impact, I, I think the report highlights sort of primary care uh, and Annika also sort of highlighted that primary care piece where really the sort of the COPE notices have labeled um, sort of to move from a situation where control of that data was really within the hands of individual GP practices who opted in or out of different uh, effectively sort of cohorts such as CPRD or key research uh, and also chose whether or not they'd uh, as you say honor a person's consent and flow data to UK Biobank actually what was created now is a cohort for sort of 55 million population both through NHS Digital and the British Heart Foundation Data Science Centre work on uh, what's called impact COVID trusted research environment also obviously enabling open safely and enabling those reliable flows of data to things like UK Biobank. So I think that's been probably the, the biggest piece. I guess it also highlights the sort of the challenges and why what, what was fit for, for sort of the pandemic or what is fit for the pandemic isn't necessarily fit going forward. Uh, and that obviously picks up the GP data for planning and research, uh, which I guess you know, highlighted the fact that 
yes, public benefit is quite clear in a pandemic, but going beyond that, you really do need to start to make sure that you've got all the right uh, sort of hallmarks in place, which I think, say, the report does a really good job of outlining. But they are things obviously like transparency and real engagement and involvement and proper dialogue, use of a trusted research environment, unless there's sort of clear consent and ability not to, to sort of go down that route. And how do you then manage also then that sort of consent and opt out process? Uh, so again, look forward to, to further discussions on all of those areas. Thanks so much, David. Um, the mind boggles at the complexity of the landscape. You provided an amazingly um, succinct description of there, but I, I can only imagine the sort of interoperability challenges, let alone the four nation potential challenges. And we might, might, I guess, come on some of those at some point. Thank you. And, and so over to you, Jacob, if you don't mind saying a little bit again about your role and experience and, and where the report and its findings touched on those. Thank you. Sure, Colin, thank you very much. Um, so I'm Jacob, I'm the Head of Policy and Research for Healthwatch England, uh, which is the national bit of the Healthwatch network. Um, I, unlike the other speakers, I'm not an expert in data sharing, I'm not an expert in the legalities of it or the research ethics. Uh, my role at Healthwatch is to listen to what the public are saying about these sorts of issues and really sort of bring that back into the discussion. Um, and I think the, 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 the presentation so far and report, um, always encouragingly, are finding exactly the same sort of things that we're hearing from the, from the public in the conversations that we're having about what they want to see from data sharing. Um, so that is um, that's always a good start. A um, couple of points I'll touch on. Um, I'm going to start with the, the coping notices and the, uh, what was fit for purpose in the pandemic. I know the pandemic is still ongoing, but let's for a moment just think about this in terms of that very start phase of the pandemic of what the public would accept during, if you um, term it wartime, it's not the same as what they will accept in peacetime in terms of how we use uh, data. So as things become less urgent and we become into a more sort of planned environment, and it's less reacting to a crisis, we need to change the way that we think about um, what the, the public will accept. And I think GPDPR is a great example of a uh, initiative that completely missed that point. It was still thinking that we were in a water, wartime mode and it was relying on a well the public have seen how data sharing has really helped us fight COVID so now they'll be all on board with data sharing normally and it just completely short uh, sidestepped the whole need to have that com the conversations, the communication, the transparency which we've talked about which is so important. Um, Another thing that's come through in our research, which I think is relates to what one of the other speakers was saying, was about how uh, we've seen the massive spike in the use of the, the national data opt-out um, following recent uh, issues. Um, what I would say is for us, um, we're hearing that it's not all is lost. Whilst people may have opted out, they're not, they've not moved to being anti the system sharing their data or using it for um, the right research purposes. They've opted out because they're uncertain. They don't know what to do and they're, they're playing safe. So they've decided to, they've taken the measure that they can take right now to keep their data their data safe, but um, it's not that they can't be convinced to opt back in or uh, if we improve the way that we're communicating and being transparent around what, what is happening. However, I think if we keep messing up some of the big national initiatives in the way that we communicate them, or indeed we go silent for large periods of time, I think that's a real problem. So right now GPDPR is a great example of a project that had a load of noise in the summer and we've heard nothing about it for almost six months. And that creates suspicion, confusion. We don't address the problem head on and we will gradually erode, erode public trust over time if we're not careful. So one stat I will share is that, you know, we've seen um, from Healthwatch's work on this that Currently, public willingness to share their data uh, with the NHS is 53%, uh, according to our national polling that we did on this, which is down from 73% in 2018. As I said, it's not because people don't trust the NHS, it's because they're uncertain what to do. So we can gain that ground back again, but it is a significant problem. We are eroding it over time. And the last point I'll touch on in my intro um, uh, which I don't think was really in the report. I haven't seen much of it anywhere really. And it's an area that Healthwatch is now starting to explore and be useful to add into the conversation is what is the, what is the penalty for misuse of data? 
So we talk a lot about building trust and building transparency, and we make a record, you know, uh, make a big deal of that. And that's really important for the public to know how their data is being used. But people also tell us that they want confidence that if someone misuses it, they will face an appropriate penalty. And I don't, and I don't think we are not acknowledge that enough. That even with all the right regulatory and legal safeguards in place, there's still a chance that data can be misused. And we need to be very clear about what impact that has and what the consequences will be in order for people to trust that their data is always going to be used safely by the NHS. And I'll stop there. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jacob, and for giving those incredible stats from, from your organisation. That's really, really helpful. Uh, and also for a slightly provocative uh, question there, which we might come back to in a second around penalties. Um, but I'd like to finally turn to Alison Hall, just for your uh, reflections. Alison, if you could say a bit about your role and expertise as well. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Colin. So um, I've been working on regulatory and ethical issues around the use of data for health for, for nearly 20 years. And taking that thought about penalties for misuse, um, I think the, the, the regulatory landscape pre-pandemic was um, influenced by worries about sharing data and the penalties of potentially mis-sharing mis or misusing data. And so the landscape is complex, is dynamic. The data protection landscape with the GDPR imposed big penalties and fines potentially for, for um, misusing, uh, misprocessing data, but the situation relating to confidential patient information was a lot less clear. And so the impact of the COPI notices, I think in our view, is that they did have a, a significant impact in um, facilitating some of the initiatives that David mentioned, uh, the central role of, of HDR UK in, the, um, in providing a, a gateway for uh, data to be processed by researchers. Um, but one of the reasons that they were effective was that they gave people the confidence to share confidential patient data, um, which they didn't previously have. So that's sort of turning your point on its head a bit, Jacob. Um, I suppose another thought that we had about the COPI notices was that they streamlined existing processes. So for example, the confidentiality advisory group met more often, met virtually, and were able to, the throughput of projects was greater. Um, I think the challenges going forward are around trustworthiness, transparency, and engagement, as, as uh, all the other speakers have highlighted, but they're also about clarity. So there's a real lack of clarity in different uses. We highlighted in our report the lack of clarity between research and surveillance, um, because that's key as the pandemic um, progresses. And I think we see that with the new variant um, in, in the last week, the balance between surveillance and, and, and research. But there's also a real lack of clarity in what constitutes a COVID-19 purpose and how far that extends. You know, so if COVID is having an impact on health and social care to the extent that all other clinical specialties are affected and all other activities are affected, then can sort of planning and uh, uh, planning those other clinical specialties be said to be a COVID purpose because they're all impacted in some way? So I think um, they key points that, that I'd want to highlight, and also the temporal element of this. As the pandemic proceeds, the emergence of new variants, that balance between surveillance and research might change. Um, and when do we say that the pandemic is, is ended? Um, and as other people have, have mentioned, when do we cease to rely on these emergency measures? When does the emergency become um, routine. And with flu, of course, there's constant surveillance, 
of new variants that have an impact on health and kill thousands of people each year. Um, and when will we be at that stage with the pandemic? So that's something that's uh, that's a, a scientific empirical question in some ways, but it has enormous impact on um, public trust as well. So I think that's all the points I'd want to make at the moment. Leaves Thanks time so for questions. Much. It certainly does. Thank you so much, Alison. And also, you know, closing again with a really thoughtful question, I think that would, would be good to pick up with the rest of the panel on. Um, also, please, in the audience, do get some questions in if you'd like. But we, we already have some pre-submitted questions from our registration process. So I might kick off to the panel with, with one of those. And it does slightly pick up on the point you're making there, Alison, which is, what would be the potential risks to overextending the legislation or, or emergency measures and, and what potential mitigations could be implemented to maintain public trust? Um, and I don't know who would like to come in on this. I might turn to you first, Jacob, if that's all right, because this ties in a bit to what you were saying about the wartime uh, versus peacetime sort of scenario. So I think it's a really interesting question of when do you call an end to the pandemic and what will people accept of kind of, I, I think we're sort of nearing that point, um, you know, assuming seeing what happens with new variants and things. But um, I think we, it's the definition of what is relevant to the pandemic is becoming tighter and tighter all the time. Um, and I'm not sure that we could extend co the coping notice to cover uh, uh, much further. I think if you were, it, as long as we're communicating clearly about the purpose of the of the research project, then you can maintain the public trust. And it comes back to that transparency in that com conversation and thinking this is a continual conversation. This is not something that we're going to set up once, and that's a set of rules for now how we do data sharing forevermore. That showing that we're moving out of what we've learned from the pandemic into needing a more continual conversation will be where we need to move it to. And that's how we maintain trust over time, is talking about it all the time, and being open and transparent about it. On the point about um, penalties, I will just say, I'm not necessarily in favor of, I can see how the COPE notice improved the way that we're sharing data to support research. It's not supposed to stymie it, but there are going to be certain things where we could give more cast iron guarantees about what data won't be used for. I think Colin, you talked about insurance, for example, that goes right to the heart of one of the public's main concerns about this. Cast iron guarantees about if the research uh, or data is ever used for insurance purposes, I think. Um, so yeah, having an ongoing transparent conversation and some cast iron guarantees about what won't happen and penalties if it does. Thank you, Jacob. Anyone else got any thoughts about that, in particular on the sorts of mitigations, David or Anna, I see you both coming in, David. Oh, okay. To you, David. Thank you, Rochadid. That's very kind. Um, so I think on, on the sort of extending or the overextending, I suppose a few few quick points. I mean, firstly, I guess the fact that the COVID notice has been extended, I think was, as you say, three times now, um, actually probably we need to reflect for future pandemic preparedness as to how long initial COVID notice should be in place once we know we're in the severity of a situation that we were in uh, to really avoid the uncertainty that's existed at every sort of cliff edge that's come by uh, and the sort of the noise that's, that's gone around that. Um, in terms of the sort of extending, I think, again, there's two bits. So there's a business as usual bit, isn't the route for research that needs to continue beyond. And, you know, the science will take a lot longer to work through uh, than the sort of the pandemic itself. And we don't we, we really got to make sure we don't sort of stymie those efforts. And I think the related point to that is then about the data collections. And again, we know back with the GP data for planning and research that actually there isn't a a ready to go alternative there. So actually there's a real risk to some of the research that's taking place when those coping notices come to an end into, and the directions to NHS Digital in terms of that collection that we've really got to manage. I think one of the key pieces to, to avoiding sort of overextending is really that, that piece around data use uh, registers and really understanding how the data is being used and then sort of lay or public involvement in data access decision-making. Um, and allow the sort of the public to be the best judges of whether they're still delivering the public benefit that it's expected to deliver uh, under a sort of copy or wartime type situation. Bit of consensus developing there. Annika, do you do you follow that vein? Or? I, I do, but I also want to just go back to the point. So the copy notices are about um, sharing data when we haven't got 
explicit specific consent to do so and actually sometimes we do have that um, and yet still data isn't being shared because it's because research is seen as some sort of optional extra to healthcare so I, although I think it's really hard to do I think we need to look much more at this area where it's quite difficult to distinguish what is research and what is clinical practice and that is really the case in genomics that we can't move forward in our healthcare without um, entwining it with um, I put research in inverted commas because I would say that it isn't always clear research it's so entwined that really some people might argue it's healthcare and other people might say well it's sort of a learning healthcare environment um, yet if the copy notices govern those and they are removed after the pandemic then I, I think that's not moving forward I think that's still treating research and clinical practice as very separate and we we've got to find a way I don't know what the answer is but we've got to find a way of of governing that hybrid space between the two a bit better. Thanks, Annika. Alison, have you got any? Well, I, th I think I just wanted to to add this sort of tension that there is between the utility of the data that you have and its potential identifiability. Um, and so, in a way, in the genetics context, you know, you, if you have both the uh, if you have the genetic information about a virus and the host and you have the clinical symptoms then that is re and, and perhaps you have something about the geography then that is really useful but if you only have the genetics then that's that's stripped of some of its utility um, and so it's this tension between having that richness and being useful but also wanting to um to remove anything that might be identifying and potentially used in, you know, ways that are discriminatory, uh, and and that's that's the sort of paradox that underlies all this. Thank you, Alison. I'm aware our time is slipping away, and we've got some great questions that come in actually from the audience currently. So, one is, what do you think are the main challenges faced by the health and social care system in shifting to a more public focus? transparent way of using confidential data. I think it's been touched on a bit, but does, that, does anyone want to come in on, on that question? Perhaps I might reverse order and say, Alison, have you got any thoughts on the challenges there that we've not touched on already? Um, Jacob, please do. I think the biggest challenge is getting the workforce on board that people engage with. So this can be such an abstract topic um, for the system to communicate to the public. And actually, it's when you get the interface between a GP or a practice nurse or someone and a, a patient where the conversation becomes real. And that might be because you've got some data that's relevant to be shared, or that might be because you've heard something in the news and you want to have a conversation. So we need to have much better training and space for frontline professionals to understand what's going on very difficult ask right now in particular given the pressures on the service I do understand that but I think that's where it, we've got to have the conversations where they're really actually meaningful because otherwise this can be a bit too abstract and the vast majority of people still won't engage in it until you get a big scandal blow up like GPDPR that you know uh, which is then fuels miscommunication so I think it's that allowing that front uh, space those frontline conversations. David. Did you also have some thoughts? Yeah, I, th I mean, I think the really well put made points, Jacob, and agree with, with that. I think the, the only other point I sort of wanted to make was really regarding sort of, I suppose, control and trust. So actually, this is about how do we trust the sort of the publics or lay members to get involved in particularly, say, sort of data access decision making processes um, and realise that actually and, and in control of their data and, and realise that they will, you know, be good judges of, of public benefit and I think the, the National Data Guardian work around uh, really sort of understanding public benefit and assessing public benefit is, is key here uh, and when you can move into that situation you've got an ongoing sort of dialogue with that and specific involvement in decision making then you should be able to give demonstrate far greater trustworthiness uh, than we can in a world where actually control is held either in you know scientific review committees or in GP practices or, or wherever it might be. 
Thank you. Anybody else coming in on that point? Thanks, David. The, um, the, the sort of follow up in the, in the question and answers, Phyllis, was um, around an important topic that we touched on so heavily, and I think it's one it would be good to hear the panel's views on. It's how we deal with the potential inequalities in missing and incomplete data in um, in certain data sources, you know, that are interact, impacted on by these notices, um, so that perhaps the measures aren't impact, aren't benefiting groups equally. Um, what can be done essentially around fixing that or putting in place you know, governance arrangements to help address that? Has anyone got thoughts on that? Well, I think that's comments from Mavis. No, Mavis makes a really good point there. I think that we need to do, um, we need to focus on that much more because certainly from the um, genomic database sets, our, our biobanks cover mainly people of Northern European ancestry. So our interpretations for what that variance mean for healthcare is heavily biased towards that group. But I'm encouraged that um, over recent years there's been big efforts to redress that balance. I think it will take some time, but it needs a particular focus on doing that so that genomics is as useful to people who don't come happen to have had their recent ancestry from Northern Europe, um, because that really is, um, is a sort of shocking inequity um, in this day and age. David. Uh, yeah, thank you. So I think a couple of uh, sort of bits on that. So absolutely on that sort of recruitment to, to sort of cohorts piece is absolutely essential. I guess if, uh, on a positive, I think that the, the sort of the coping notices and the joint working has allowed greater understanding, at least, of the data quality issues where we've been able to bring together sort of ONS census data alongside the, you know, the data that exists on the, the personal demographic service, sort of spine type data that in, in NHS sort of digital within the, the hospital episode statistics with then what's held in GP, day, GP records in terms of the GPES sort of extract and to really understand that in England. I know that's happening in the other nations as well. What we've really got to do now is to sort of do the work to get that, that better and more consistently uh, sort of recorded and captured and used. Thanks, David. Jacob. So I think um, we could do more research into the attitudes towards data sharing amongst different demographic groups. It's one of the things that does, I've seen very little done to date really about different ethnic group, groups, different age cohorts, different parts of the country, different, you know, we're not doing enough, we're not being enough inquisitive enough. And that will affect, particularly if you have um, opt-outs, for example, and they're easier to access, easier to navigate and use. If people are opting out, oh, is one group opting out more than another? And I think we need to ha expand the conversation to make sure that we're covering all of those different demographic groups in society and to make sure they have their say on how data is used. And that will help us understand why we might also have some gaps uh, in, in data sets moving forward. Thanks, Jacob. Alison, any thoughts on that or... Uh... And what I can see is that we are heading towards the end of time, but you, you've just picked up on the really difficult, I think, question that, you know, we can make some progress in, but there are lots of further areas to work on in terms of how that conversation and engagement works um, and how we can take that forward in the way you describe. Uh, another sort of really big picture question, I suppose I could uh, close on probably a little frustratingly is, is the international sort of, um, context and we've had a question which is you know are there lessons to be learned from other countries in this regard um, and I'm also aware we've been very focused on the experience in England in relation to this regulatory um, you know set of measures but are there also lessons or, or, or learnings from across the UK as well um, for processing confidential patient information for research purposes Alison I don't know if you want to come in on well, I, I just wanted to turn the question on its head a bit and say that actually we have seen the benefit of international collaborations in actually learning about um, the virus and, and, and COVID-19. Um, and I think that's that's something to take away, the, the power of these big collaborations. Yeah, very true. Thank you. David, have you got any reflections just from a kind of pan-UK 
level about how you know how things have worked across the, the four nations? Uh, yeah, I would say I suppose very very quickly. So I think the the area which we've probably got this most established in terms of that sort of ongoing dialogue and understanding with both practitioners and the and the public uh, in terms of Wales and the Sale Data Bank run out of University of Swansea, uh, we're able to move very very quickly uh, and effectively to sort of enhance and, and, and sort of if you want grow that data asset and make it available for research. Uh, I think then actually the copy notices in many ways allowed or enabled England if you want to sort of leapfrog uh, the other nations in terms of particularly the primary care data. Um, and then there were sort of, sort of Scotland, I think is then sort of, you know, has been somewhere in between. So I think where it's been clearly for surveillance purposes, that's that sort of worked well with things like called the EVE2 data asset, um, but where that's then extending to broader research, we hit that sort of barrier that's been highlighted. Uh, and then I think, again, it's been from a sort of a focus on Northern Ireland, it's worked well, but that's still hampered by the sort of the regulatory and sort of, the legislative sort of situation in, in, in the province. Thanks, David. And we are just up to time, so you kept that perfectly timed. Um, and that's a, a much bigger piece of work we'd love to go on and look across the UK. But for now, I'm going to have to bring this very interesting discussion to a close. And I'd like to say a huge thank you to our excellent panellists um, who've brought such a wealth of experience and insight to our conversation. Uh, and thank you to everybody in the audience who submitted questions now and, and beforehand. Um, if we haven't fully whetted your appetite, please do read the report itself for more detail and, and share with anyone who might find it useful. Um, we'll hope you, to see you again in the future for further events and for more discussion on this and related topics. Thank you. Goodbye.